Please let's make us worthy to celebrate the feast of your transfiguration on the mountain with purity and holiness, with divine praises and with hymns of the Holy Spirit. May we be filled with spiritual joy and gladness and raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit now and forever.
appeared on the mountain you called Moses and Elijah to witness to you, and you confirm the faith of your disciples, accept our prayers and the fragrance of our incense, grant us joy and happiness with you in the light of your eternal kingdom, where we will continuously praise and glorify your Father and your Holy Spirit forever. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, 
And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Praise be to God always. established. And so St. Paul is contrasting between the Corinthians 
these two, for the Corinthians, these two laws, Mount Sinai, which they know very well, and of course this new covenant of which they are now baptized faithfully. So we have to have an understanding of what took place on Mount Sinai. So St. Paul makes allusions to it, but it's understood that you know this. And so on Mount Sinai, you can read it, it's in chapters 32, 34, 24. You read it in the book of Exodus. The time when the 15 centuries before our Lord, when the people of Israel leave Egypt and go to Mount Sinai to render worship and adoration. Moses goes up the mountain for 40 days. When Moses appears and communicates with the people, they are overwhelmed and terrified because he's radiating light. His face is shining after this communication for over a month with God up the top of the mountain in the clouds and in the lightning. And so they basically scream and he, they ask for him to cover his face. So he puts a veil over his face. And what Moses does then is when he communicates with Israel, he covers himself. When he goes back into the cloud to speak with God, he uncovers his face to receive the revelation of Mount Sinai. So this is the story of Exodus. And what St. Paul is saying, that if the law which was carved on tablets of stone was glorious, but was meant only for a time, then how much more glorious is the eternal covenant in the blood of our Lord which brings salvation? And so he's contrasting the two. Remember, Corinth is that difficult parish, but the people are always causing difficulties. And St. Paul is again trying to raise them up higher to understand what the Gospel is teaching. Now this is also an advance from the first letter to the Corinthians, where he finishes the letter speaking about the resurrection. There is a moment that we have hoped that we, the baptized, the faithful, those who follow our Lord, will rise in glory with Him. But it's a vision of the last day, at the end of time, when the world ceases and is transformed by the appearance of our Lord. Here he is taking that definitive vision in the future and making us understand that it is now. This is the meaning of that the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It's the transformation that we already see in Moses on Mount Sinai, which is glory. But St. Paul wants the Corinthians to understand that that glory is given to all of us, now, by grace if we are with unveiled face. Because what he does as a contrast between the two is to show that if what Moses did in that glory, then for us with unveiled face, that that transformation of the light of God transforms us now from image to image to the reality to conform to Christ in this life. In between that, he talks about the veil. The veil does two things. One, it covers Israel, it covers Moses so that the Israelites do not see the glory of God. And they do not come to that fullness of God's law. And therefore, he speaks about the present generation of Jews who do not believe in the Messiah because he says the veil covers their hearts. And so they do not understand Moses when he is read each week in the synagogue. Remember the first two centuries after our Lord, there is this whole battle that goes on back and forth, especially within the Aramaic peoples. They are the people that our Lord came to, spoke their language. And the contrast and the conflict is over, is this the Messiah or not? And so, St. Paul is dealing with this issue here and now for the Corinthians. And he says that the Jews have done by refusing the Christ, that veil remains over their heart of the old law. So they do not understand Moses when he is read. He said that when the conversion is when the veil is taken away and they see the Christ, and 
and seeing the Christ, we are able then to be transformed in glory. This is the whole understanding of glory, which in the Old Testament is called kabod. Doxa in Greek. Our word doxology is to render glory to the Holy Trinity. The freedom that he brings, in fact, Steve and I were discussing this before Mass. Because throughout the centuries, you've always had individuals who think that the freedom of the Spirit means, Yahoo, do whatever I want. And I told him, I said, this has gone on for centuries. In the church, we call it antinomianism, which is a very fancy word to just mean to be against the law. Nomos in Greek is law. To be antinomian just means you're right. You're against the idea of directions. And we've done this century after century after century. So we talked about Oneida in upstate New York. It was kind of a free love commune in the 1850s. About over 300 people lived together, and all the men were married to all the women, and all the women were married to all the men, so it was free love. People used to travel up. You know the name Oneida because you know the flatware that comes from them eventually as a company for them. But even before that, in the 16th century, with the Protestant Revolution, you have the antinomians who were known as Anabaptists. They are the ancestors of the Amish that we all romanticize. Well, the Anabaptists in those generations took over militarily the city of Stuttgart. And Stuttgart became a free love city. We all shared each other's women. That's in the 16th century. So you have to understand that San Francisco, New Orleans, Mardi Gras, those are not new inventions of the 20th century. We, human nature has done this continually. And sometimes those who want to keep the name Christian refer to these kinds of texts and say that's why Jesus has made us free to do whatever we feel like. Of course, it's absurd. Because what St. Paul makes clear to us is that what this freedom is, is a freedom from the law of Mount Sinai, it's a freedom from sin, and a freedom from ignorance. Because it is an illumination of glory. And what it does in turning us towards our Lord, notice the quotation, that we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the reality of Christ in His glory. That means our goal is to become like Christ. It's not the question of following laws. It excels over it, not because it means that we're free to do whatever we feel like, which is usually as we see in the 16th and the 19th century and the 20th century and every generation sexual things. But it is a freedom from what has bound us by Mount Sinai and from the ignorance which is part of our lives but what it binds us to is this glory of Christ to become more and more like Christ by our lives. That is our goal. That is the demand of virtue. That is the requirement of what we are supposed to be doing as being the disciples of our Lord. So on this aspect then, the freedom is profound, it is radical, and it is the transformation of the individual by faith and by baptism but it also requires the personal engagement to be able to contemplate our Lord and that freedom. And I'll finish with one little last anecdote. This, growing up in the city of Detroit, this quotation was always part of us down by the Detroit River. There is a big statue, and over the top of it, it's a figure, a big golden figure kneeling down, and on one hand, it's holding this orb with gold rays coming out of it, and on the other hand, it has a family, a man, a woman, and a child, all looking up towards this light. Now, over the top, it's entitled the Spirit of Detroit, but the quotation on the back wall of the statue, you never build this statue these days, over the back of it has this quotation from the Corinthians, the Spirit of the Lord grants freedom, and that there where the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, we are granted liberty. That's what is engraved on the back of the statue down in the very center of the city. But of course, for them, they did it for a civic vision. But we come to understand that the profound freedom that takes place 
is that we are given to break the shackles from sin and from the ignorance to be able to contemplate being personally each one of us engaged with our Lord and in that contemplation to be transformed into true freedom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
on to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, Lord.
Holy Son, and true Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who is life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. The Lord God, the Lord God, and the number of all people, <coughs> look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty, and bless them with every spiritual blessing. <coughs> Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your own Son. Rather, make us worthy of sharing your holy, life-giving mysteries of purity. We may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. And each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts of the holy, the perfection, the purity, and sanctity.